to welcome uh, to our panel on the power of collaborative innovation. You're not seeing double. It's the same title as the title of the entire conference, whatever that's worth. I'm Steve Adler. I'm Editor-in-Chief of Business Week. Delighted to be moderating the panel. Um, I just thought I'd give a very brief introduction to the topic and then introduce our very distinguished panelists, all of whom are CEOs of companies that engage in a great deal of collaboration, so I hope we'll have a lot to learn from them. Um, it does seem as if there's somewhat of a revolution taking place in the way companies function and the way they interrelate. Uh, barriers are coming down both within companies, the so-called silos being broken down within companies, um, and of course between companies and very many other constituencies, companies and their customers, companies and competitors, uh, in some cases companies and uh, government uh, agencies and uh, non-governmental organizations and certainly with suppliers. Um, it seems as if the new technologies were sort of necessary to take us to the next level on this. Uh, the internet, new, new communication technologies, how fast you can move information around uh, certainly has facilitated this change. Um, there's something also I think defensive about it with uh, low cost providers around the world and so, so much going on around the world where you're competing with lower cost providers. I think the big multinationals have simply been forced to make sure they're being um, as, uh, as efficient as they possibly can be. Um, and the third thing I think is cultural. Uh, we live in an age where people are expecting to participate, they're expecting um, to communicate and uh, I know from my own experience that when you start bringing younger workers into the workforce, they're kind of insisting on working like this. So I think all of those things are probably coming together uh, to bring this flowering uh, of collaborative uh, innovation. The, it brings about, I think, some great opportunities which our panelists will talk about and I'll also try as a journalist to press them a little bit on the obstacles or challenges um, that it may create and, and see if we can learn from that. Um, clearly, there's the issue of protecting your intellectual property if you're out there sharing information very broadly. Um, there's the issue of protecting your brand when you're partnering with other brands and you don't always know exactly what they're doing and what they can do can, can uh, certainly hurt your brand. Um, and there's certainly also the issue of how you train a workforce and how you motivate a workforce um, to be wanting to collaborate uh, with other companies across borders, even with other operations within your own company. So I'm hoping that this conversation will draw out some of those themes as well as get into some specifics. Um, our panelists, uh, starting closest to me in an alphabetical order, are uh, Jacques Egrin, who is uh, CEO of Swiss Re, uh, Carlos Ghosn, who uh, is CEO both of uh, Renault and Nissan, uh, Tom Gloser, CEO of Reuters, Mark Parker, CEO of Nike, and Hector Ruiz, who is the CEO of AMD. And I'm just going to start with Col Carlos. I mean, what were you thinking bringing together a French car company and a Japanese car company? And what have been the challenges and um, what are the benefits? Well, uh, first, obviously, if there was no very important business need, the two companies would not come together because th there is no model to follow. There is nothing existing where you say, I'm going to bring two companies together. I'm not going to merge them. I'm going to keep them uh, totally different, uh, totally autonomous, but at the same time that identity is going to be different, they're going to be working to develop synergies. So you have to innovate because there is no reference, there is no textbook, there is no experience like this. And you need to do it by appealing to different cultures, company cultures, Renault is different from Nissan, and country cultures, Japanese people react in a different way and think a different way than the, than the French people. So, but when you are in a situation like this, you are forced first to collaborate because this is an alliance. And second, you have to uh, you know, start from a white sheet of paper. So you need, to, you need to innovate. In this case, you need to make sure that you have a very clear strategy. You know exactly what you want to do, that uh, this strategy is simple, it's shared, and you never deviate from it. What have you done about some of the cultural issues that might come up uh, between the two different workforces? Well, you know, it, it's interesting because usually when you have, you know, talking about diversity in a project, a massive project like this because you're putting two major companies uh, uh, together, uh, well, if you don't have a common goal, it's a mess. I mean, we know it. Uh, diversity is a handicap if there is no goal. Now, people see only the weaknesses. They're going to see all the the difficulty, they're going to see all the obstacles. So if there is no goal, people focus on the differences and they see the weaknesses. Now if there is a goal, there, if there is a goal which is shared, people feel good about it, they are motivated, it's a good purpose, it's something which makes them feel good about themselves, that will overcome this and transform diversity into a strength. 
Well, I'm sure we'll come back to that theme. I want to talk to uh, turn to Hector Ruiz uh, because you have a very important uh, partnership with IBM, and it's been in the news. Perhaps you want to break the news here, but uh, there's been suggestions it's going to get even more formal and more important. Um, and as I understand it, that's not a partnership that sprung up overnight. It's something that's evolved over time. And I thought it might be instructive to talk about how you, how you built it, um, what you did to make it work, how you dealt with the different cultures, how you dealt with trust issues, and um, just kind of where you've gotten it to the point, uh, how you manage it, where you've gotten to where you are today. Sure, Steve. You know, first of all, it's, it's truly a, a collaborative innovation because we are partnering with IBM to develop technology all the way from the basic R&D of materials all the way to manufacturing technology. So it's, it's a very broad collaboration. And it started many years ago, and I have to say that after five, seven years of doing it, uh, we're finally at a point where I believe this is truly a collaborative, innovative relationship. It's taken quite some time to finally get there. And my view is, frankly, that if uh, it, when it starts off, you know you're a little bit in trouble and it's not gonna, it's gonna take a while to get on it. When, you're spending the vast majority of your time talking about what if we get divorced versus what if we actually can succeed together. And I think that's a red flag, and it starts at the top. The top of the, the two companies need to send a signal very strongly that, you know, we are going to do this. This is important. This is a matter of, of critical to both co companies. And as Carlos pointed out, is you share an objective very strongly. And, uh, and uh, so it starts by there, and, and, and you have to meet often. Uh, ever since we started a relation, we met once a quarter at a pretty high level, detailed discussions, how the project is going. And one of the things that became pretty critical is how the management of both companies had to dictate the pace at every meeting that this was going to be a successful collaboration. And slowly, the barriers began to come down. And um, as I said before, I believe today is a very effective collaborative innovation uh, example, but it took frankly, years together, and I'm, I think it's the closest thing I can think of uh, to getting married with somebody. It really takes a while to, to finally fall in love. <laughs> um, any comment on any further, uh, uh, further falling in love that may occur uh, in the near future? No. Okay. <laughs> I had to ask. Okay. Um, let me let me turn uh, to Mark Parker. Um, Nike makes uh, much of the uh, concept of collaborating with the customer, and it's something people have been talking about a lot uh, at this conference and in general. And I think Nike's been doing it uh, for quite a long time. Uh, Nike ID may be one of the more famous uh, aspects of that, where the customer gets to design the shoe, uh, looking at different uh, materials and different colors. And, and I wonder if you could uh, talk, make it a little more real for us. Uh, it sounds a little bit like a cliche partnering with the customer. What does it mean in practice? What, what are the elements of partnering with the customer and, uh, and, and how do you do it? Well, you know, with a, a brand like Nike, there's a, there's a deep relationship that we have tried to develop through the years. It used to be a little bit easier, I have to say, in the sense of, you know, there's 12 channels when I was a young kid and growing up and now there's infinite number of uh, ways to connect and reach consumers, uh, people around the world, and, you know, and it's an opportunity on the other side. I think we have embraced that change. You know, there's uh, never have, has there been as much uh, ease in accessing information and knowledge around the world as there is today, and that's changing as we, you know, as we speak. Um, the access to choice, you know, the number of choices people have. Uh, so it's, uh, it's, it's a different consumer today than it was even a few years ago. Uh, the, the consumer is much more knowledgeable. Uh, they're, they're much more demanding. And I think uh, there's a, been a massive shift to power uh, to the consumer. And, and I think the, the other thing that's changed is the, um, you know, the, the relationship isn't just a company like Nike just communicating out to a consumer. It's a dialogue. You know, the, the, the mediums now in terms of communication allow a dialogue to happen. So, you know, that, that's another opportunity for us to, uh, to connect and actually uh, create opportunities for consumers to connect with themselves. Um, you know, one of the uh, more interesting ones of late was uh, the, the relationship, the great relationship, I should say, we've had with uh, Apple, where we've actually connected the physical world of running, let's say, with the digital world, namely their iPod. So literally there's a... Uh, a transmitter that's in the shoe that sends a signal to the iPod and basically tells you things like how fast, how far you're running, calories burned. But that technology actually uh, 
part of that experience is an online experience. And uh, I think at latest count, we're approaching 40 million miles run by Nike Plus users, and that's going up dramatically uh, every week. You know, and they talk to each other. So we've actually created a, a way for them to connect and communicate and uh, organize runs for charity, uh, competitions that take place between a city in the USA or a city in, in Europe or China. And that'll cultivate, or that'll, uh, I should say, culminate uh, this summer with uh, a, a very big special event that we're uh, uh, looking at creating on a, on a massive global scale. But that's really been, uh, uh, it's been, um, we've been able to realize that opportunity because of the, the technology that, that exists today, you know, for people to communicate. But it's really important, I think, to create that uh, deeper relationship and we can go much more surgical. You know, it used to be you'd advertise on a major channel and reach the world with a blanket advertising speaking out. Today, you can actually have a dialogue in any piece of your business with different types of uh, consumers, uh, customers. So you can go a lot deeper and, uh, and connect at, a, I, I think, a whole different level. But that creates some challenges as well, because now your, your marketing budget has to get, you know, divvied up to uh, different pieces of your business. Um, You've got different parts of your business communicating in different ways, uh, and you've got to keep that together as a brand that has some integrity and, and basic principles that, that, that transcend each piece of your business. So lots of opportunity. I, I don't look at this change as a, uh, a threat. I don't look at it as a, um, a big obstacle. I see it as a, a massive opportunity. Great. Thank yeah. you. Um, I, I want to turn to Jacques uh, Egrin. Um, I went to a breakfast he hosted uh, earlier in the week, and uh, there were some fascinating things that they were talking about. Uh, that they've been involved in creating these catastrophe bonds, weather derivatives, uh, as they look at climate change, looking at ways to spread the risk uh, for climate change. And one of the new projects that I'm going to ask him to talk about, which is a multiple collaboration, uh, is in Central America uh, that involves um, governments, insurers, and charities. And would you talk a little bit, a bit about that and the collaboration involved there? Thank you, Steve. Um, yes, indeed, in our business, we are dealing with extreme risks. Um, it's very remote from the direct consumers, by contrast to my colleagues here. And um, however, it, it, it fits very well with this topic of collaborative innovation, because many of the problems that we have to deal with can only be handled through some form of cooperation with NGOs and with governments. And uh, recently, uh, an area where we have started to develop and actually culminated in the practical uh, issuance of the uh, insurance coverage uh, this week is to actually provide emergency relief under the form of reserve funds provided by the capital market through private sector solutions paid at market prices but effectively funded <coughs> by upfront money from charities uh, which in case of catastrophes earthquake in that case in El Salvador and Guatemala, which are well known for their poverty, would provide for immediate availability of funds, not many months later, but immediately, so that the relief can be provided. And in a way, it's a telling example of the fact that you can do something which, in all honesty for us, is a for-profit business, but which actually helps an NGO achieve its goals with a solution which is considerably more efficient than if it was only governmental, particularly for countries which are, of course, relatively poor in terms of their budget deficits and their circumstances. What were the challenges in getting the governments to get interested in this? And uh, we're talking about collaboration. What are some particular challenges uh, to collaborating with governments that, that you've found? Well, you have a, the many layers of bureaucracy, of course, and the normal resistance that exists with that. You obviously have the, the pure budgetary constraints, which in that case is is, uh, is being solved by finding the solution through the NGOs uh, and their extremely constrictive involvements. And you have, of course, the tendency, quite natural on the part of the public sectors, to have a, a little, little def defiance about what's in it for us, the, the capitalistic company, um, and, uh, and what's in it for them. So you have to, to build trust. It goes back, actually, to what Hector was speaking about, uh, whether it is between two corporations, or it is between a government and a corporations, it's a question of trust, conf confidence. Okay. 
Uh, finally, Tom, um, in the, uh, at Reuters in the 19th century, you collaborated with carrier pigeons to uh, increase uh, the sp speed of transmission of information. Uh, but now you tell people that uh, you've got to be really light on your feet to be looking for the next great improvement in, in, in transmission and of information and speed. Um, I, I, I use that as a segue a little bit to a question that I think underlies some of this, which is, as you collaborate, as you develop partnerships, as you share information, as you open up your networks, uh, kind of whatever happened to the secret sauce, whatever happened to the secret ingredient that might give you a competitive advantage, are you losing something through collaboration? Um, well, first of all, the trouble with those pigeons are they're messy, so you get a big drag coefficient if you're trying to be fast. Um, you know, every business has to think carefully about the trade-off between what am I going to gain from collaboration? Number one, what do I know I'm going to gain? You know, we choose partners because we think they can provide particular attributes. You know, Reuters is partnered with Nokia, not because my wife happens to be Finnish, but because we have a relationship to create a mobile journalism device called Mojo. Um, we knew why we wanted to work with them. But there's also a, you know, maybe a serendipity effect, which is you don't know some of the things that will come when you put people together in a room and version 1.0 may be sort of ho-hum and version 2.0 may go off in a totally different direction, but you won't get there if you don't start. So you've got the known things to do and the benefits that may flow. And you do have to trade it off. I mean, if you own 100% of the next incredible idea, you're probably not going to call your you know, five best friends and say, let's all share this together. Um, you know, we're, we're not all that altruistic. Um, but I think on balance, um, you need to have in the toolkit um, a healthy use of collaboration. Just taking that point a step further and opening it to the group in general, because I think intellectual property is one of the things that a lot of business people are concerned about, and there's kind of an evolution in thinking about this. There's the concept of open source innovation, the notion that um, if you find out great new ideas, it's going to benefit everybody, and then there, there are people who are very concerned that they spend a lot of money on intellectual property, and uh, if you open up networks and communications networks, um, that you're simply, they're simply going to leak out, they're, they're going to leak into the broader web, that that's going to actually cost you. Does, it, does anybody have thoughts about that or experiences with that? Well, when, when, when you're going to collaborate, you're going to have to share, and from time to time you have a question like this, for example, I can take the example of uh, making a transmission, um, a very uh, sophisticated transmission, and transfer it from Japan and build it in China, automatically you have the question about how much you're going to be able to protect your intellectual property. Well, the solution that we find is when you collaborate, you're going to have to divulge a lot of things. You're going to have to share a lot of things, but you're going to have to single out what are the pieces of technology in your device that you consider absolutely critical. And it, obviously, it cannot be the whole device. You're going to have to really do some serious engineering work about zooming on these particular pieces that you don't want to share, limit them to the maximum, and just ship them and let the, the rest of the job being done. So my point is intellectual property is always a risk. Now you want to limit the risk by keeping the core, most critical part of this technology when you collaborate and share the rest. Okay. Um, go ahead. I, uh, giving a totally different uh, angle. In our case, the intellectual property comes in terms of the uh, quantitative modelings and various uh, web-based uh, insurance underwriting methodologies that we use in particular for life insurance side. And developing in China, for an example, we are providing all the instruments uh, through, through the internet directly to the point of sale, which means agents which are anywhere in the, in the Chinese landscape. And obviously the question marks does exist. Uh, are certain are we that the model is not going to be scrutinized and frankly the, the intelligence which is embedded into it taken? The reality is that the beauty of, of the modern IT is that it's only as good as the data that we have put in it, and that data evolves literally every week. And so to the extent that they play the game fairly, they continue to have access. If it was not fair, we would just switch up the access. So the, the software is not very important, the content is. One 
Just a comment on that is that, <clears throat> you know, in our industry, and it could be different in others, but in our industry, the more uh, restrictions that collaborative innovation has relative to IP, the less likely that it's going to lead to a successful innovation. And so one of the challenges the partners have is can you push it as far as you can? And one way to accomplish that is to truly understand each other's businesses and respect and trust each other. Because there are times that you don't write it on a piece of paper, but you know that if you disclose that to somebody else, it's going to damage your partner, even though it's not written down. And I think that takes time. It takes an understanding. It takes an investment of truly uh, wanting to learn and understand your partner's business so that those things can be more effective. Does that argue to not having too many partnerships simultaneously? I imagine it's exponentially more complex as the number of partners grow. Yeah. Yeah. Yet, Carlos, you have many, many partners, and uh, all over the world you're partnering. You're partnering in Eastern Europe, you're partnering in Russia, in Russia you're now part partnering in India to create a low-priced uh, car. Yeah, yeah but they are very specific. Okay. You know, they are not the same. For example, we have a partner in India for a particular project that you mentioned to bring a $2,500 or $3,000 car on the market, and um, you know th th that's it. That that's a partnership. That's the objective. That's a, the the product we want to bring. And and, and here that, that's an interesting case because you know that you cannot do this car yourself. You cannot do it because it requires uh, very frugal engineering management and attitude and behavior that you find mainly in India. It's very difficult to reproduce somewhere else. But at the same time, your partner who is Indian, who, who get this frugal approach, he needs some of your technology, some of your know-how and processes. So that's, a, that's an excellent case where you say, well, the product cannot be, ca cannot, cannot be generated unless you have two parties coming together, each one sharing part of their knowledge to make it, uh, to make it happen. We have, the, we have the electric cars. That's, that's also a very interesting story. I mean, if we were to develop an electric car by ourselves, it would certainly be wrong. Why? Because we have decisions to make. Uh, and these decisions are related to how customers are going to use electric car. Is it more important to have a smaller battery, cheap battery, or is it more important to have a charging time? You know, when you plug, how much time would you accept to charge your battery? Is it, for the moment, the technology allows you to charge your battery in seven hours. Seven hours is a long time. How much is an adequate time? Is it one hour, two hours, three hours? Well, the response to this question will determine what's the size of the battery, what the cost of the battery. So if you try to answer all of these questions alone, it's going to take you a long time before you come with the electric car. If you sit down with a partner who knows the market or who knows the infrastructure, and he's going to tell you, you know, I'm going to build a system where, you know, three hours is fine, but give me a more affordable, more affordable battery. This kind of collaboration between different parties where you are constantly innovating because you know exactly what is the need of your customer, extremely important. But it's not multiple. Every time it's very focused. You know exactly what you want to collaborate on and what is the final product you want to bring on your market. Um, before we open up the floor, I wanted to ask a question about uh, the notion of collaborating with, with people who may otherwise be your competitors. Tom does it all the time. There's, uh, he's, he's sometimes working with people. He's sometimes competing with them. Um, Mark, you're, you work with, uh, you have a uh, direct, you're starting to build more direct to retail operations. You have partnerships with places like Dick's uh, Sporting Goods where there's a private label ar arrangement. Um, in addition, you're really you know, selling Nike goods. So talk a bit about how you manage a relationship uh, where you're competing some of the time and, um, and collaborating uh, another part of the time. I think, that's, I think that's just more and more of the reality uh, in, in the business world today. Uh, our re you mentioned retail. We have uh, most of our businesses through wholesale partners, uh, not direct retail, owned retail. And uh, what's critical for us is to make sure that uh, we're actively looking to help them grow their business and different, differentiate and distinguish them from each other. Otherwise, it drives consolidation and it limits growth potential for them. So we're, we've been taking a much more active role in, uh, in, in what, what does the Nike brand and the product and the experience look like, feel like at retail. Because uh, frankly speaking, a lot of the retailers in our industry really need to progress. Uh, it's a bit of a dated, uh, and as a general comment, uh, uh, retail uh, industry. So, so we've been much more active in, in developing a brand experience with retailers. You mentioned Dick's, for example, a large uh, sporting goods uh, retailer in the U.S. 
They have, as many other retailers have, private label businesses that, Foot Locker, the same thing, that compete in some cases with our business as a competitor, a more direct competitor. So we, you know, we figure out where we can grow our business, where we can help them. Some of that, I mean, is not an issue with us because, you know, it helps them differentiate themselves from other retailers as well. And in the end, that's really critical because if everybody starts to look the same, I think there's really limited growth potential. Ultimately, the most important thing that we can do, any company can really do, is make sure that you have a strong, relevant, compelling brand as well as your product. And if that's there and it sells through the retailer, then, you know, they're basically going to be a great partner. If that's not, then forget about it. It's just you're in trouble. Tom, any further thoughts on competing and collaborating with the same people? Yeah, I mean, we do it all the time. We do it without thought almost because in the digital ecosystem, it's very difficult first to tell, well, whose data is it? So let's take the financial services business. You know, an individual decides to make an investment decision in their IRA account, goes to a broker. The broker executes, executes on an exchange. The exchange wants to sell you the data. The data is carried over Reuters, commingled, presented with news, et cetera. Whose data is that? We found ways over the years to, you know, work so, basically work in partnership so that you don't need to spend all your time with the lawyers defining, you know, whose data is it at that point. It's all one large mashup. And as long as each party in the chain is very clear without a negotiation about what their role is, you know, we don't try and set up, you know, brokerages in competition with our customers. And therefore, they're willing to leave us the room to do what we do best. As a lapsed lawyer, I want to pick up on that lawyer point for a moment because I think it is an interesting point. As collaborations proliferate, how much of the work has to be extensively lawyered and have to have massive documents to look at every possible contingency and how you're going to get in, how you're going to get out? Or have we gotten to a more informal phase where the nature of the collaboration is, we've been talking about trust, is are somewhat more informal arrangements? Well, I guess as a former lawyer, I can answer that question. You were a much more serious former lawyer than I was. When we partner with BT to, you know, run our networks globally, Ben Verweyen was going to be here today, we have a big contract to do it. It's really important. It's hundreds of millions of dollars for both of us. Conversely, we'll allow our content, you know, we let Google play with our video without a contract very quickly. We do it with lots of folks because, you know, we can just shut off the tap. And with real-time information and certainly with news, yeah, there's some value to historical news, but not if you're sitting on 12 days' worth. So it's horses for courses. I think I'll throw out one last question and then open it to the floor because we haven't quite gotten into the workforce issues. And I have a couple of questions broadly related to that. One is, are your various countries' educational systems training the right workforce for the 21st century? Are the schools, particularly at the lower levels, aware of what's going on in the world? And are they thinking differently about how people are being trained? And are there other things that you can do with your, through your HR or other ways, to get people to focus more effectively on collaboration? Feel free. I think there are some pretty basic things that we need to do coming from experience of having people of different countries working together or different. The most important one is very basic is the language. I mean, when in the Renault-Nissan alliance, that was interesting at the beginning because we had to select one language with which we were talking to each other. And I mean, it was difficult to choose Japanese because I think French people would have had a lot of problem. French was also a big challenge for Japanese people. We ended up choosing English and it was very widely accepted because when Japanese discovered that it was as hard for them than for the French to learn English, it was okay. So we started, everybody, you know, I think we had massive English lessons in Nissan and in Renault. Everybody was working hard, learning English, and it's today the language of the alliance, which is amazing that we selected one language which is absolutely not the native language of any member of the board or any member of the executive committee. 
so back to this, I think it's very important that some basic things, I mean, language is an important one. Uh, learning also, you know, to abandon preconceived idea about different cultures. These are the kind of basic things that we need to develop within companies and, and also into the education system. Other comments on that, on that question? Well, in the, Go ahead. In, in, I'm, by contrast to Carlos, I'm, I'm obviously a very, very small employer. We have the ultimate wholesale organizations, but uh, obviously it's exclusively professional level. And one thing that I would love to see much more at the university level is to give them a sense of mobility, a, a passion to actually travel and be mobile, not, not just to travel uh, you know, for, for a two-day trip, but to relocate and to experience the world. Uh, we, have, we have considerably less employees at our headquarter than we have in many of the other locations where we work, and we need our people, uh, we need this experience to be shared, and we need our people to, to move from one country to another and to have excitement about it. And, and admittedly, this is a challenge. Uh, it uh, it's, doesn't come as automatically in the mindset of the younger generations as, a, as I would like to see it, and as I, I was privileged enough to enjoy it. Uh, it's a broad topic. Feel free to ask questions on any aspect of it to any of the members of the panel. Um, okay. um, hi there. My name is Mark Terrell. Um, I co-founded a company called Imaginatic, and we're a technology pioneer. And I'd like to think that the conference was named after us, and we've got the Technology Pioneer Award, because our company does collaborative innovation systems. One of the things that I find very interesting with this discussion is, and, and, and even just this discussion around energy, is that there is an incredibly large untapped resource that hasn't been mentioned today, which is the brain power of your employees, the brain power of your customers and your suppliers, and almost to move away from the sort of the ignorance of the elite, the arrogance of the elite that five people in a room can solve a problem, and instead take it out to 10 or 15,000 people. Um, I'd be very interested in what your organizations have started to do in this effort, and how would you plan to increase your efforts in the coming years? First of all, I'd like to make a comment on the, uh, the issue of collaboration within a company. I mean, this topic is mainly focused on external relationships and how important that is in tapping into the larger collective intelligence and open sourcing. And, but I think it's really important to look within your own organization, your own company, your own uh, immediate team, if you will, and look at how do you uh, culture or, or, or uh, establish a culture of collaboration within your own uh, organization. It's, it's, uh, I think there's a lot of opportunity for companies to get better in that sense before they even go outside of the company. Not, not that it's an either or situation, but frankly speaking, if you're good at collaborating within the company, you're going to be better at collaborating with people outside the company. Anybody else on the panel on yeah, that one? I'm just going to chime in specifically on innovation. Um, you know, many of us probably do similar things, but what we've done at Reuters is create an internal innovation program, essentially an internal VC fund. Any employee can get grub stake to an initial amount of money on a one-page document. Um, the key then is how do we kill uh, these ideas as they progress through the chain. And we don't just have you know, three wise white men uh, reviewing everything. The management of the fund both has internal and external but it's very specifically focused on the great ideas that come if you listen inside your company. Tom, of course, also blogs and exchanges comments with employees, people inside and outside the company in his blog. It's called Tom Gloser's Blog. Oh, thanks for the pitch. <laughs> um, Jeff, you want to ask a question? I'm Jeff Jarvis. I blog at buzzmachine.com and teach at City University of New York. And you started at going to where I want to go, but I want to push a little farther, I guess, with kind of best practices and neat tricks. Uh, you're all big and old companies, and I think we look with some jealous admiration of the new and big companies. Uh, you know, we all know how Google gets innovation going with its 20% rule. Uh, Facebook, I, I think, makes mistakes very well, and you know, is not afraid to invent things. And if people give him problems, a week later he fixes it. Um, Wikia is having, uh, Jimmy Wales is having his people write their own code. Those are fairly radical things for us. So I'd like to hear kind of your best tricks, and, and, I, and, I, and I worked in the news business for my career and know how hard it was to get any change in that business and kind of despaired of it. Um, so how do you get at, I mean, 
it's an obvious question, but I want to hear your, your best, best practices and best tricks besides the two you mentioned of getting that culture of innovation and cooperation with outsiders within the company to be able to be open with things, to be able to listen to other uh, ideas, to be able to take risks, uh, to not over lawyer things. Tom, you mentioned you know, seeing where things get killed in the process. Uh, I think that's the key is your own culture and that this is a new concept and I just want to hear your best practices and we can compare them to how good Google's and Facebook's are. I'll make a comment. Uh, it's a simple one, but frankly, um, I think this culture of collaborating with the outside is just got to be part of the DNA of the company. And I don't think it's something that uh, through programs or training or you can change overnight. Uh, and therefore, it starts a long time ago. And, and the only the one issue that I would point out is is a, almost like a religion to us is when we hire people, they get quizzed incredibly intensely about how they would behave in a cooperative environment. And so uh, we put a lot of effort in how when we bring people into the company, at least to make a judgment. Not We're not always right, and we sometimes make mistakes, and we have to correct them. But make a judgment at the beginning, uh, uh, to see, is this the type of individual that we would like to see in the company? Does he show, does he exhibit, or she exhibit the, the characteristics of a collaborative individual? And we put a lot of effort in that, and what we find out is that it pays off. Uh, it, it, it truly leads to a much easier environment to uh, encourage and, and, and actually execute a collaborative environment with the outside. Okay. If, uh, if I may add uh, a point, I think the question is extremely relevant, and uh, uh, it's, it's absolutely clear that a company which has had a very long history accumulates uh, force of habits. It has a very good side to it, and it obviously has some, uh, some consequences. In our case, we are a very young company of 145 years. And uh, that, of course, comes with, uh, with a cost, uh, which is this uh, uh, of a tendency to, to look at what you are used to do and the way you do it as being the best, which, of course, is exaggerated. And um, so you have to, in a world which changed much faster, um, you, and, and where you encounter effectively uh, the sociology of a company, which is slower moving, you have to really rely on, on change agents. You have to, to detect the type of talents and that goes across generations who have the intellectual curiosity and the desire to effectively change the, the, the body politics and the body language of, uh, of the corporations. And over time, you can do it. Uh, again, maybe with the privilege of being relatively small in terms of number of employees, but I think your question is very relevant, and that's a, that's a day-to-day -day struggle. You cannot just change it with a, with a magic button. Yeah, I'd like to jump. I think it's a great question as well. We, we think about this uh, every day. Uh, I think one of the things you have to do as a company is make sure that you're organized in a way that actually stimulates a culture of uh, collaboration, if you will. Uh, we are, have recently gone through or are still in the midst of a big transition within our company uh, to actually break it down into smaller, uh, what we call category-based, uh, and I'd say more entrepreneurial or intrapreneurial kind of units. And the, the focus is to make uh, the company or the brand and the product more relevant, more compelling within each of the pieces of our business. And also, so we've co-located uh, across functions and, and uh, networked uh, across geographies uh, in, in a more intimate way and in, in a deeper way to connect uh, in, a, in a, again, a deeper way with the consumers that we're trying to uh, you know, create a dialogue with. And out of that deep connection uh, comes the specific ideas of how to connect, how to be relevant. Um, we do a lot of work with different blogs in terms of uh, you know, that, that specialize in different pieces of our business. Could be a sport-based blog, for example. And uh, we can go very deep into that blog and really speak to that community and even set up communities and allow them to speak to each other. And again, there's a lot of very specific ideas that come out of that connection, but it, it's really critical that you're connected to your consumer, you're listening to them. It's not just you creating something and pushing it out. It's actually having a dialogue. And again, those specific ideas flow, you know, in that type of situation. And where we've done that, we've been actually very successful. Where we haven't, we have not. So, Has anybody else up here changed your organizational structure to be more um, focused on collaboration in recent years? No, I think it's 
mistake to to do that because general generationally this is happening anyway so you know we don't spend a lot of time at reuters even though we run a large instant messaging and collaboration service internally we don't have to teach the kids coming in out of school you know instant messaging is just part of the accepted practice and similarly the ideas of you know webex meetings or whiteboarding or any of the collaborative tools it's it's just in the in the ether and so our journalists now they want to blog not because they want a separate identity from Reuters um, we give them the environment within Reuters.com to do it because it's a richer way to create content mashups and otherwise um, provide the experience that they now expect just to take, take the microphone okay uh, thank you for a wonderful panel this afternoon. Uh, I'm an academic. I work at New York University, so I have a multi-part question, but it's all around the same theme. <laughs> um, I'll pick up on the theme that uh, you mentioned about marriage. And just like in marriage, you have to signal before you get married that you're a good partner. So how do you signal uh, to potential collaborators out there, and there are so many of them, that you're likely to be a good partner? Are there some that you would not collaborate with and therefore not care to signal to them? And what are those characteristics that you would look for? Um, the other uh, issue is kind of connected in most instances is how do you, how do you ensure cross-gender collaboration? Uh, and last but not the least is uh, how do you convince the potential employee uh, whom you are assessing as to whether or not he, she, he or she is a good collaborator? How do you convince that employee that you as a company are good at collaboration. Thank you. Three-part question. Anybody want to take on any of them? Um, uh, you know, it's a, first of all, it's a excellent questions, uh, and I counted more than three, uh, Stephen. But let me just briefly say uh, that um, uh, it 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 all starts. You know, uh, let's talk about trust. I mean, trust is a key element uh, in our industry, in particular, a key element of collaboration. You know, our industry has to invent things. You know, it's, uh, it's, an, it's an industry that relies on invention of things. And, and so you have to have that respect for the inventiveness of the uh, partner. You know, you're not going to collaborate with someone who uh, has a poor record of invention. So, so you, and the trust, unfortunately, I only know of one way that trust gets developed, and is, it gets tested. You get an experience, you work together on a project, you uh, do things where you you by the nature of the business the trust gets tested and you pass that and you begin to signal then then the partner begins to sense uh boy this this company is you know really uh, has shown a good part then then you begin to take it to the next level and the collaboration goes deeper and deeper uh, as an example when we started with ibm since we were using that as an example our collaboration was limited to a narrow perspective and as we worked together a year he brought in and brought in and, and one of the things we learned jointly was that by restricting that collaboration, we were making it damn near impossible to invent things. And so we finally came to the realization that we had to really open that up significantly to allow the technical people to truly benefit from what was the richness that those companies had, which was the innovation portfolio. And so, uh, again, that's one example. There's a lot of, lot of dating that goes on before you get married, and not every collaboration uh, leads to a marriage, uh, and some of the dating is fine. I mean, I think it's some of the best work we've had has come out of the you know, less intense, long-term uh, types of collaborations, and some of them may be down to the, an individual level, in our case. Um, but it's important to get out and, I think, play the field a little bit, to stay with that analogy. Uh, and we do a lot of that. I think, you know, as a company, we've always been uh, a very collaborative kind of focused. Our company was actually founded by a track coach and his athlete. And, and if you look at most of the pieces of our business, there are really uh, a significant number of collaborations going on. But, you know, they, they, they uh, vary at, you know, different levels of intensity. But there's a lot of, the other thing I want to mention along that line, too, is that there's a lot of uh, uh, disruptive um, opportunity that comes from connecting with uh, people outside the company. Many companies get very comfortable in a certain way of doing things, things that have made them quite successful. 
but things that, if they don't change, can be quite, quite dangerous in a way. And when you're connecting with people on the outside with different points of view, uh, you often get people challenging your, your position. And I think that's incredibly healthy to, to have an open mind, uh, to have enough trust in a relationship with somebody uh, that you're working with to you know, accept that there are different points of view and approaches. And today, as fast as things are moving, it's really critical that you expose yourself to those different points of view and you're open to you know, that type of change. Otherwise, I think you could be in, in great trouble. Anyone want to tackle the cross-gender question? Does anybody see that as a collaboration problem? Um, I think it's a more general issue in companies. So um, and we, in the media governor's uh, sessions, uh, I chaired a group about how to cr use uh, reverse mentoring as a way generally to um, help break down the ceilings to the extent they exist. Um, I think there, you know, women in our companies aren't yet at the level of, you know, total freedom to collaborate. But I, I, I don't see it as a specific issue for collaboration. I think of it as a general issue of you need diversity for uh, lateral thinking and you need lateral thinking for growth. And if we want companies that grow, we better start at the seed. Okay, go ahead, Sydney. When you uh, depend on uh, many people and entities for your innovation, you are really entrusting your brand uh, to different people. And uh, these days where compliance with uh, increasingly complex laws in uh, privacy or uh, foreign corrupt practices, uh, accounting and others, uh, this creates potential risks to your reputation. So how do you think about assessing and managing those risks? But I'll start with the easy side because we don't have really the brand dependency in the same way as uh, uh, the, our, our brand is so, so much on the wholesale that it would be of no particular concerns to, the, to our clients who are on the contrary on the retail. Um, the, but the issue we have is indeed making sure that uh, our, our risk capital uh, is being provided for the right use. So what we have invested intensely on is to, is to really focus on the sustainability of the decisions. That includes the, uh, uh, what I would define as the, the political selections uh, for any business which may be viewed as being directly or indirectly related to areas or geographies which uh, uh, are presently, from a UN perspective, inappropriate. Uh, so that's a, a very strict selection process that we have in terms of any endorsements of any business which uh, effectively, even if we are very remote from it direct, uh, ourselves, uh, would effectively go against the, uh, uh, the uh, UN-defined uh, agreements in terms of uh, countries. I think the question also more broadly goes to, to issues of quality control with your partners and uh, particularly people who have consumer businesses and are doing contract manufacturing or parts manufacturing have a special issues with it. And I was wondering if maybe Mark and Carlos could comment on it. I, at various times, I'm sure you've had issues with this, and I know obviously Mark, no, you have. I think it's a great point. Part of innovation, uh, particularly technical innovation, is being today slowed down or even eliminated or not even launched just to make sure that you don't have a quality issue. That, that, that's, a, that's an important element. That means in the car industry, you know, many of you have experimented new devices in the, in the car, and the advantage of getting a new device is completely uh, overwhelmed by uh, you know, the first hiccup you have in the system. You, know, you cannot start the car. You don't understand what's going on. You have a signal giving you an information, and then you discover that this information is wrong. I mean, we all know that if you invest uh, a lot of money, a lot of resources, you come with a very good idea, but this idea is not robust, that the application in the car is not solid, user-friendly, people don't understand it, it's not reliable. Um, well, it's a handicap, it's not an asset. So we're slowing down, in a certain way, innovation to, the, to make sure that whatever we put in the car is reliable. Uh, reliable and understood, that people understand exactly how it works, and they understand the message that it's reliable. Mark? Yeah. I'd say, first of all, one of the most important things to do is, you know, knowing how to pick your partners well. 
you know, that's, that's sort of a baseline, you know, common sense thing to do, but uh, I think you get into trouble when you don't really do enough due diligence in terms of who those, those critical partners are. And then I think it's having clear expectations on both sides and then making sure that there's a lot of communication that takes place. If you're going to entrust somebody with the critical part of your brand, you better stay close to it. Some of that's legal and contractual, some of it's uh, relationship building. And when I say relationship building, I mean in a real qualitative sense. Uh, so it's not just a contract, you're, you're close. And as much as that can feel like it's part of the company, as opposed to somebody else outside, the better, I think. And then I think everybody has to own uh, some piece of that relationship. You talk about uh, the manufacturing piece of the supply chain, for example. It's critical that that's not just the sourcing department within the company, for example. It's not just the CR function. Everybody does something that has some impact on that relationship and making it work. So it's critical that, that there's total engagement. You know, some of the things that we're doing right now, for example, in sustainability and product design, uh, that's not just Nike working with the factory to reduce waste, to change, you know, get rid of PVC, harmful chemicals, that sort of thing. There's a design element, for example, that's a real critical part of that. There's things you have to do up front to make sure that your quality doesn't become a problem. So th these are all things, I think, really broadening the, uh, the engagement within the company to make sure that you're really looking at it in a more complete way uh, so that you don't have those problems. Because it's not a department's issue, it's the company's issue. Okay, other questions? Go ahead. Marty G. A synopsis. Uh, in so many ways, you talk about uh, the partnership all in personalized terms. You know, relationships, trust, dating, and so on. And in many times, you said, "Oh, we have to communicate and make sure we understand each other, etc." How do you deal with the fact that uh, the relationship has to transcend individuals? And how do you deal, especially with companies where they have a practice every year and a half to move their executives around to a new role? And there you go. You just built a relationship, and you just signed an agree agreement and all the people you trust are now somewhere else and the new guy says, yeah, not my, my problem. Well, I think there's one really simple answer to that. And there's somebody in the room here today where um, Reuters had a relationship that, that fell right into that problem. Um, you got to have an economic alignment, assuming this isn't just purely a sort of charitable cooperation. Um, because that's the, you know, that's the mainspring which is going to ensure that whoever's in place, if they're rational and look at the best interests of their company, they may fight, I want a bit more of it than the last guy negotiated for, but the fundamental idea that there's value to be created for both parties and that not one or the other gets the whole pie, if you have that solidly in place and understood, it will transcend changes in personnel. Um, Hector, you talked a lot about trust. Do you want to pick this up? Well, the question that Art raises is a huge one uh, for companies like ours uh, because when it takes you four or five years to develop a product uh, and you're going to jointly uh, collaborate with someone in the innovation side, um, that is really a big problem. <laughs> and and uh, I would have to say for us in particular, if we, if we thought a company was going to be very... Um, uh, unstable in its management structure, I think it would not be a good candidate for that. I think perhaps there has to be some way of balancing that, for, particularly for us in our industry. And one way to do it is the, the economic value, definitely it's got to be a big thing. But the other one is uh, to, um, to have the working level people that in this particular case, if it's going to be a joint product development, that they're really so intimate in the product that perhaps less subject to uh, turmoil if there is a management change on top. Because sometimes the strength of the alliance is actually the strength at the working level, the people that are really truly building the product. And we tend to try to create that bond early in the project, as early as one can. You know? Okay, I think we probably have time for one or two more questions, if there are any. Okay, one here. Oh, one more. Okay. Say one part question. Okay. Okay. How about um, innovative collaboration instead of collaborative innovation? 
So it goes back to the question that was asked earlier, what might be some best practices? So if you can kind of tell us something really innovative that you've done in your collaborative endeavors. Well, you know, you say the, the, the subject of today was how do you, how do you innovate in terms of product, service, etc., by collaborating. You're saying how do you innovate the way you collaborate? Okay. Well, we do it all the time. We do it all the time. I mean, if, if there is one thing which is continuously changing today is the way you're organized, the way you manage, the way you see, you see things for a very simple reason is fundamentally for a lot of organization, for a lot of institution, organization is a tool. It's not an objective. It's a tool. I mean, you always try to go faster, get your product on the market, get a better quality, and you're always changing the way you're doing it until you get it right. And when you get it right, you want to make sure that you're always optimizing it. Let me, let me give you an example. I mean, I'm, I'm back to the lines between Renault and Nissan. Um, we're changing all the time. We're adapting all the time. Every time we find the problem, we have to reorganize ourselves. We have to reassess the way we are working together because, again, we have no reference. And problems keep coming. And we know that if we keep the same organization, we're going to get very quickly obsolete. So we're doing it all the time. We, 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 don't, we don't think about it because it's, it's systematic. It's not a goal. It's a tool. We're doing it all the time. OK, well, thank you all. I'm just going to sum up briefly and try to capture what some of the people uh, on the panel <laughs> said. And uh, uh, clearly, trust building was one of the things was seemed to me one of the key elements. And despite some challenge to it, I, I did hear a lot of dating and marriage uh, analogies, and it sounds like uh, the panelists uh, think of it to some degree that way. Uh, the need to, uh, to have, when you do an alliance, to have a clear and common goal so you know exactly where you're going with it, one of the ways to get the, uh, the, the, the groups to work together. Um, the, the notion that uh, Hector put forward, but other people talked about, of starting narrow and going broader, um, another way to look at it, I think Mark mentioned it, is you know, throw a lot of things out there, try them. Um, if they work, build on them. If they don't work, that's okay. Uh, try something else, and I think that's in the nature of what we're all learning about innovation and about uh, collaboration. Um, and then the importance, uh, which I think uh, people didn't talk about doing that much specific about, but the importance of uh, trying to make sure that your uh, your work environment uh, is is built around this concept, and that you're thinking about how people are organized in the workplace, how they're thinking in the workplace, how they interact, what mechanisms they have to communicate with each other and with the, with the outside world, which is something that I think came out in some of the questions from the floor and some of the comments um, up here. Uh, so I, I think that's a brief summary. I, I really want to thank the uh, the panelists uh, for their contribution. Thank the audience for theirs, and. Uh, Session's over. Thanks so much. Thank you.